Hello and welcome to lesson 16. In this lesson we'll be learning about how to add images into our document. Right, so to begin with, grab some images from anywhere you like, from the internet or from your, your computer, and move them or copy them to a subdirectory within the same folder where all your HTML and CSS files are located. Okay, so I've created a folder called Pix. You don't have to call it Pix, you could call it Images. And paste your images in that subfolder. It is possible to keep the images in the same folder as your HTML files, but then starts becoming a little bit messy. Okay, so I'm going to start by showing a picture of a man. So that's man.jpg. To do this, I need to use a special tag known as the IMG tag, which is short for an image. Now the IMG tag is an inline tag, which means it needs to be enclosed inside of some sort of block tag, such as a paragraph. So we go IMG. There's no closing tag, so that's all you do. But then we need a couple of attributes before the image will work. So a good reference for different attributes for an image. Once again, W3Schools. You can go to the um, tag reference for HTML and look at the IMG tag. And then here you'll see an example of how to add an image into the document. You'll see there are various attributes they've used here, such as SRC, which refers to the source of an image. Alt, which refers to alternative text. And obviously the height and the width of the image. If you scroll down here, you'll see all the different attributes that you can put into an image. As you can see, there are quite a few. Um, but not all of them are supported now in HTML5. So you should only use attributes that are supported in HTML5, such as alt, height, src, and width. Those are the ones we're going to look at now. We're going to start with the src, which takes a URL and it refers to the address of where is that image located. So let's add in an src attribute. Remember the attributes always go before the greater than sign of the opening tag. So we'll go src equal to and your attribute value always goes in between double quotation marks. Okay, so I want a picture of man.jpg. Okay. Now, where is it going to look for this man? Well, I've given it a relative path, which means it's going to look in the same folder as where this HTML file is stored. Now we know that that's not actually correct because I created a subfolder called Pix where I put my image. But just for fun, let's see what happens when we specify an incorrect source to the image. Okay, so you see I get this weird looking icon here, and that means broken image. Now, uh, this will be a little bit different from browser to browser. Some browsers may display a red cross or something similar to indicate that the image is a broken link, cannot find that image. Okay, so I'm going to fix this up now, specify the directory where we can find this. Notice the forward slash, remember on the internet, there's no such thing as a backslash. Everything is forward slashes. And now it is able to locate the picture of the man. It looked in the pic subfolder and from there it displayed the picture of a man. Don't start with a, fo with a forward slash because that means go all the way up to the top of the file system. And so in my case, that would go all the way back, all these levels of directories, and it would not be able to find the image. 
If your PIX folder was a previous folder to where your HTML files were located, you would do this. Dot dot slash. Dot dot means go back one folder. And you can do this as, as many times as you need. So depending on how many levels back you need to go, that's how many dot dot slashes you'll need to add. In my case though, I'm not needing to go back any levels because if you look at the folder structure, here is the HTML file, lesson 16. So relative to that, I first have to go into the pick subfolder and then I can access main.jpg. So we start immediately with the name of the folder we need to access, forward slash and the, and the file that we want to, to load. It's also possible to specify an absolute path to an image. For example, you could say, if you were working on a Windows machine, you could say something like C drive, documents and settings, user, website, pics, man.jpg. The problem with this is that it would only work while you're viewing the, the site on your local machine. As soon as you upload it to the internet, the image will no longer function because on the internet there is no such thing as C drive documents and settings. So that's why it is always better to use a relative path rather than an absolute path because in that way when you're testing your site on your local machine it will work and when you're testing the site on the internet it will also work. Assuming of course you've uploaded that whole PIX folder to the internet as well. Alright, the next attribute that we need is the alt attribute. Now the alt attribute, if you go back to W3Schools, stands for alternate text for an image. So alternate text is used to describe what the image is about. So I would say something like man looking up. Uh, for blind people that are looking at the internet, they obviously can't see the images, so their software will read to them what the image is about. So that's why this alt attribute is actually compulsory according to the W3 standards authority. So your website will work without it, but it will be not it won't be validated if you had to try and validate it using the validated tool we spoke about in an earlier lesson your site would not validate correctly until you put in an alt attribute. Another advantage to specifying an alt attribute is that then Google will be able to find your picture much easier. So if we had to do a Google search and search for a picture of a pink helicopter for example Amazingly enough, Google is able to come up with several thousand pictures of pink helicopters. And one of the ways it does that is by looking at all the alt attributes of images all over the internet and checking for keywords within that text. Okay, another tag or attribute that we can add to our image is the width and the height attribute and it's measured in pixels. Okay, so if we go to our file manager and hover our mouse over the image, some file managers you have to right click and look at the properties. And then you can see the dimensions of that image. So this man is actually 1000 pixels wide by 667 pixels high, which is pretty big. And of course that impacts on the file size as well. See it's 155 kilobytes, which is a pretty big file for one picture on the internet. We try and aim to get our pictures around about 30 kilobytes, between 20 and 30 kilobytes each. Just so that it loads quicker, you know, in some parts of the world the internet connection isn't very good. And so if you had 10 pictures on a page, 
and the user had to wait for all 10 pictures to download and each picture was 100 kilobytes that could take a while that would be almost a megabyte of information to download so how do we get this file size down well one way of doing it is by resizing the image so getting those dimensions down okay now it is possible to artificially resize the image so for example I could say width is equal to 300 height is equal to 300 the problem with doing this is that the file size will still remain exactly the same we're only going to change the appearance in the browser the other issue is that if you adjust the width and height by the wrong ratio you can see what happens I've now landed up with a square instead of a rectangle so now the image has gone all out of proportion so what we need to do is we can just set one of the numbers and HTML will automatically calculate the other number for us. So now the ratio is correct. No longer looks funny. It's the, the proportions are correct between the width and the height. As I said before, the problem is still the file size is still 150 kilobytes. So it will still take just as long to download. You won't notice it now because I'm on my local machine. It's instantaneous. But as soon as we upload this to the internet, there will be a delay while this image loads. So you need to get yourself a graphics software, some, some sort of graphics tool. I'm using GIMP. Um, GIMP is free software, which is really nice. You can download it from GIMP.org and it's available for Windows, Mac and Linux. So you just go to GIMP.org and hit on download and then you can choose which operating system you wish to download for. You can just go to show other downloads. So this is GIMP for Linux because I'm using Linux. Um, but if you go to show other downloads then you'll see you can also download for Windows. Linux and Mac. So this is GIMP for Mac. Is GIMP for Windows. You can download it here. And it's really pretty small. It's only about 100 meg to download. Or you can use something like Photoshop if you're lucky enough to own such impressive software. The only issue with Photoshop, of course, is that it's very expensive, whereas GIMP is absolutely free. But there's many other tools that you can use. There's Coral Draw and Fireworks, and um, many other tools are able to resize images. So let's let me show you GIMP quickly. If I open up an image of the man. Then I can go and resize that image, set the width to about 300 pixels. Notice the height automatically adjusted. I scale it down. Uh, if my zoom is at 100%, that's how it would actually look in real life. That's the actual dimensions. And then I'm going to just overwrite that image. And then if I really go to my code, I can actually now remove the width because I've already resized the image and there we have the same image but the difference is that if you had to now look again at the properties of that image you'll see the width and height has been resized and the file size has dropped to 30 kilobytes as opposed to 150 kilobytes so that's quite a significant drop which will equate to a much faster download of your your web page at the end of the day okay so let's do the exercise one more time I'm going to put another image next to this this time 
we'll use a picture of a plane. So first thing I need to do is I need to resize this image down to the correct dimensions. doesn't have to be 300 pixels but 300 pixels will allow me to put two next to each other could even put three next to each other if I wanted to another thing is when you save as a JPEG a JPEG has an advantage that it's actually a compressed file format so we have a slider here where we can adjust the quality of the image this is actually how much compression we're adding to the image. So JPEG is almost like a zip file. Um, the more, the higher the quality, the, f the larger the file size. Um, so the lower the quality, the smaller the file size. So it actually adds compression as you drop the quality of the image. And we've normally found that about a 90% quality is a good number to aim for. So that would be say 10% compression, 90% quality, somewhere around there. Just that little bit of compression really does help drop the file size even further when you save your image. Okay, so now that I've saved this image, I can then add that image either in a separate paragraph but that would mean they would be one underneath each other or I can just put them within the same paragraph so just for neatness sake I just like to type it like this with the image indented I'll just use the tab key to indent from the margin and in this way it's easier to visualize what's going to happen okay remember the alt attribute is used to describe what the image is about. Especially for blind people, for search engines and so on. Okay, so I've got a picture of a man, I've got a picture of an aeroplane next to each other. In terms of the spacing between the images, we can fix that up using CSS. If we just add a margin to this image and that will show you later on. Uh, if I wanted to now I could add a third image next to this and then um, I could also have images underneath as well. Okay so the types of images that you can add to a document these are JPEG images and we've just used two examples of a JPEG Remember that JPEG works really nicely for photos. It supports 16 million colors. So that allows us to have photographs in all their splendor. At the same time, it supports compression, which means we can then get the file size down. We obviously compromised a little bit on quality, but Remember, this is the internet we're talking about. It's not a glossy magazine. And then another type of file that the image tag supports is the GIF image. And a GIF, unfortunately, only supports a maximum of 256 colors. So it can only be used for things like icons or uh, logos or something like that. Um, the other type of file we get that we can display is a PNG image and this is actually was designed as a replacement for the GIF so most people would recommend that you would use a PNG rather than a GIF uh, one reason is that a GIF a PNG supports 16 million colors just like the JPEG does and then um, a PNG supports transparency, so you can have a transparent background. Um, GIF also supports transparency. 
and then we also have a BMP image which is a Windows bitmap file which you can display using an image tag the only problem with this is that the bitmap file is generally quite a large file so it will take a while to download so it's really impractical for web purposes so in summary I would just stick to using JPEGs for photos and uh, PNGs for logos and um, things like that right you can also have a tooltip on your images now a tooltip is something we haven't looked at as yet but the way a tooltip works is you give it a title attribute and I normally just use the same text as I used on my alt let's have a look what happens so when you hover over the image it pops up a little tooltip with the description in it this one doesn't do it because I haven't given it a title this one does so if you like that type of thing feel free to give it a title as well it's not compulsory but it's quite nice remember that tooltips will not function on a touch screen so on a tablet you won't see these tooltips popping up because there's no mouse on a tablet you, you're pretty much move you know touching the screen so tooltips will only function where you've got a mouse situation it's also a good idea to specify width and height we know that we said it's good to resize the image using some sort of photo software because then you get the file size down even so it's still a good idea to put in a width and a height and we usually use the original dimension so in other words we don't make the image any larger than what it was before and we don't make the image any smaller than what it was before so let's do an example quickly if I take the man and I look at the properties you can see now that the dimensions are 300 by 200 so that means I need to go into my code and give it a width of 300 and a height of 200 okay don't worry about the order of your attributes so it doesn't matter if your SRC comes after your width or if your alt comes before your height the order of the attributes is not important okay so why do we need to specify a width and a height well the reason is because while the image is waiting to download at least the template will form at the correct dimensions and that way if there are multiple images and text and tables and headings and so on on the page the user won't suddenly see the page jumping from one side to the other side once the images have loaded because the template will have already positioned everything in the right place while images are busy uh, downloading so always always specify the width and the height of an image to make sure that it reserves the correct dimensions in the template while the image is downloading okay so the plane I would need to do the same thing this one is going to be 300 by 240 similar but not quite the same so I'll just copy and paste this it doesn't matter if you go on to the another line 240 Okay, it still looks the same. You'll you'll notice this more when when the site is uploaded to the internet, and um, then you'll have to wait for the images to download. The template will already have reserved the correct positioning for the images. And so ends our lesson on adding images to our documents.